Hello, and welcome to the Eclipsing History Podcast, a podcast where we explore the social, cultural, and political significance of eclipses through the diverse cultures of North America. This is episode four, Chasing Dreams, Watching Shadows. You can find the entire series and additional information at pgsu.edu slash eclipsinghistory. Welcome to episode four, Chasing Dreams, Watching Shadows. In this episode, we are going to discuss the evolution of eclipse watching and the growing culture of eclipse tourism and chasing. Emerging from a fascinating tale from ancient civilizations, often viewed as omens and supernatural events to scientific understandings, leading to the development of inventions used to observe celestial phenomena. Picture this. Crowds of people fill the streets adorned with their smoked glasses, filled with excitement for the event they're about to witness. At the height of the eclipse, the body of the moon shut off from the heat of the sun as well as the light. So one of the most interesting phenomena was rapid drop in temperature. This excerpt from the Mexican Herald, a newspaper in Mexico City, wrote in 1908. Wouldn't that be such an interesting sensation to experience? Magic in the whole world around you suddenly going cold and dark. I know I would get chills. Clips watching has been an important aspect of the human experience, providing spectacular visual events for watchers for centuries. While today's viewing might be different, we have the opportunity to connect with those of the past. Eclipses make their world stand still. Imagine the people at journey meetings, people flooding the streets with smoked glasses, and eclipses causing places to be renamed. Temperatures drop in low, twilight comes over the city in a busy early morning, and astronomers get busy. Yeah, imagine being on an expedition as a scientist from America, observing an eclipse in Africa with your Kodak. Yes. Big Kodaks. Yeah, and the indigenous stuff in your ears with drumming and chanting sounds as the darkness covers the earth. For you, it's about science and data. For them, it's a sign. Yeah, I can only imagine what that would be like to just experience those two different sides of an eclipse. Like, on one hand, it's for sure an emotional and maybe even spiritual moment, but there's also a lot of science that goes with it. I really just love seeing how those two sides interact in the past and even in the future. Just think about the excitement it brings to 200 foreigners on the streets of Dubian, Mexico during the 1908 eclipse. I just wonder how much work will be going on an important astronomical observational zones compared to the experience of encamping young excursionists excited to watch the dark skies. Now, speaking about darkness, in 1945, another newspaper called the Bluffton News published how Bluffton excitement turned dark as they miss out this extraordinary astronomical event due to heavy clouds. The article stated that the eclipse, which was supposed to start at 7.05 a.m. and attain 65% of totality 50 minutes later, was obscured by low-hanging clouds in 1945. The people of Bluffton now have to wait for another 25 years. That's dark. In contrast, the Ohio Democrats on June 7, 1900, talks about the watch party of astronomers observing and taking photographs of the total eclipse of the sun and the corona at Newbury. The article indicated that the pictures taken would be added to the astronomical research. The pictures taken were so amazing that the newspaper article states that, and in quote, it may be said with utmost confidence that never in the history of eclipses has such a complete set of observations and photographs been made. One of the amazing spectacles highlighted in the article is that Professor Stone of University of Virginia used a 40-foot camera. According to this same newspaper, several watch parties connected with educational institutions like Harvard converge at the places, like the roofs of hotels. Other watch parties include a dispatch boat called the Dolphin. On a board was a presidential party, including Mr. and Mrs. McKaylee. Also, the National Geographical Society of Washington came on a special steamer which was on board Professor Graham Bell. In Fremont, Ohio, 1869, viewers of the eclipse define it as startling and sublime, with planets such as Mercury and Venus being visible during totality. During the total obscuration of the sun, a silence like death rested all over the city. Imagine how eerie 
Once the sun was visible again, the article writes about the dogs in the area, who expressed the joy that they felt in a way that only dogs can. Viewers of another eclipse in 1900 in Logan, Ohio, comment on the changing patterns of animals as they acted as if it was night. In fact, the whole earth acted as if it would at dusk, with dew forming on the ground under 90% totality. Once again, observers had the opportunity to view planets such as Venus under 98% totality, as well as polar waves, which provided an educational experience all around, from those in the general public to professionals organized into watch parties. Kevin Moore, curator of artifacts at the AIDS Presidential Library and Museum, mentions that in 1878, astronomers traveled to view an eclipse in a Wyoming territory to study it, capturing the curiosity of the people. Also in 1851, Rutherford B. Hayes documents an upcoming eclipse, wondering how he knew it was coming. This shows the importance of being able to predict eclipses. The prediction of eclipses is extremely important to eclipse chasers and people like Kevin Moore, who captured this history. This understanding helps people like him prepare exhibits and events for visitors, tourists, and everyone. I think people like Rutherford B. Hayes gives a perfect example of the idea of amateur astronomy. It plays such an important role in how we view eclipses today. In short, amateur astronomy can be defined as normal people, like you and I, with no formal training or background in astronomy, taking to the skies to observe and enjoy such phenomena. I think it's important to make astronomy accessible to all, especially in times of high community engagement, such as eclipse events. If it weren't for the early amateur astronomers, we wouldn't have the viewing devices and accessibility of knowledge we have today. Who knows? Maybe we wouldn't be as interested in eclipses. Because amateur astronomers helped bring astronomy into the public sphere, I'm able to walk outside and enjoy the eclipses of April and soak up all the knowledge that comes with it. Eclipses never stay stationary. Many have to travel to even get a chance to see them, such as in 1883, when the United States had to send an expedition to the Caroline Islands, 4,000 miles west of South America or let the eclipse go unobserved. Obviously, staying stationary won't help you if you have an eclipse experience. So how do people manage such a movement? And what does that look like today? As we had the opportunity to view a solar eclipse just a few years ago. On August 21st, 2017, eclipse mania swept the nation as totality paths creeped across the Pacific Northwest to the Southeast coast of the United States. Unfortunately, Ohioans missed out on this opportunity, only experiencing a partial solar eclipse in the Buckeye State. However, other regions began to experience an increase in tourism from those like Ohioans who couldn't see the eclipse in their own region. A study done at the University of Michigan in 2018 concludes that close to 20 million American adults traveled to view the Great American Eclipse out of the 154 million Americans who viewed the eclipse in total. However, these figures are only live viewings. An additional 61 million adults viewed the eclipse electronically, via social media, television, or other methods. The Great American Solar Eclipse of 2017 swept across the entire continental United States, with everyone having an opportunity to at least partially view the exciting event. It appears the public is well prepared too. With studies stating millions of Americans took an effort to research the event better to understand it, two months prior to the eclipse, Talk about being prepared. With such a widespread event, there are bound to be economic impacts, especially as people move to find the best eclipse experience possible. As we know, 20 million Americans traveled to view the Great American Eclipse of 2017. Of course, this has a significant impact on the economy of cities travel to, especially those in the path of totality. For example, it's reported that about 1.6 million people traveled to South Carolina alone in 2017, leaving $269 million in profit for the state. Other states in the path of totality, such as Wyoming and Nebraska, saw similar effects. Of course, hotels and Airbnbs see an influx in reservations, which can fill up extremely fast in months prior to an eclipse. Even campgrounds have to navigate a higher eclipse traffic, as many people choose to camp or bring an RV to have a chance at viewing an eclipse. 
Wyoming's Office of Tourism provided data after the 2017 eclipse that concluded an average of 77.4% of visitors stayed overnight outside of their home within the state, averaging about a four days and three and a half nights in Wyoming total. Additionally, their data concludes that an average of $903 was spent by visiting parties, 369 of that being spent on lodging. Data like this makes it very clear that many will go great lengths to have a great once a lifetime experience, such as viewing a solar eclipse. But once the public arrives, hosts of events and organizations have an important role to play as they determine the best possible ways to view the eclipse. Dr. Kate Dillenbush, director of the BGSU Planetarium, provided us with information on eclipse cruises, just another way for people to view the eclipse. Yeah, so eclipse cruises are kind of a cottage industry. Um, I don't know how much, um, how much it's the cruise industry who drives them or kind of astronomy. I think they're sometimes Sky and Telescope magazine or kind of other public astronomy organizations uh, try to arrange them. And uh, they do happen often when there are eclipses. And so they're an opportunity for people to enjoy a cruise. And uh, usually on the cruise, there'll be an astronomer or maybe some amateur astronomers who are avid photographers of the eclipse kind of talking about and teaching people who are part of the cruise about eclipses and it's kind of all centered around an eclipse and they can usually make sure they can sail to a place where it's more likely to be clear that might be harder with traffic and so on uh, on the ground. Of course, safely viewing an eclipse is a priority NOAA warns the implications of what could happen if you look directly into the sun. NASA provides guidelines for how to properly view the eclipse and enjoy the experience. Most commonly, you will see people use eclipse glasses which have a special solar filtering lens that allows you to watch the moon glide over the sun without exposing your eyes to the bright star. NASA emphasizes that it is important to check your glasses for any abnormalities that could impact their efficiency. If you have ever viewed an eclipse, you may know that the eclipse glasses are not always plentiful. Although sold online through many different retailers, bug buying for events can dramatically affect the availability of glasses. If you're unable to get your hands on a pair, you can find a museum, school, or any watch party event that can get free glasses. NASA also suggests alternate methods of eclipse viewing, such as a pinhole projection. This works by clasping your hand gently enough so that there are small spaces between your interlocked fingers. Turning your back to the sun, and looking at the ground to view the faces of the eclipse. More simply, this could be done by looking at the shadow of a leafy tree, which should show similar effects. It is important to prioritize your health and safety during an eclipse to ensure a breathtaking moment. Yeah, so I had the opportunity to see a partial solar eclipse in 2017, um, and I remember that it was my sophomore year of high school. And um, instead of a normal day of school, we spent the whole day at the Science Center in downtown Toledo. I just remember everyone being really excited. Even though we only got to see a little bit of the eclipse, everyone was still super excited for the entire day. Um, and I actually still have the glasses that they gave us hanging on my wall. I also saw the 2017 eclipse, and it was a very interesting experience. A lot of people had their phones out, taking screenshots, posting it all over social media. I never know how up it was. It was all over the media and news sources. Even people that we interviewed, like Logan Rex, explained a lot about the eclipse and effects on the economic market. Rex mentioned a very high number of over 150 million people seeing the eclipse. And my memory of the solar eclipse goes way back in 20, 2006. Yeah. This happened in my hometown, Ghana, which was one of the most anticipated events ever because of decades there hadn't been full eclipse. I remember school activities and work and everything came to a standstill. It was, a, it was dark around 11 a.m. You could hear people praying, little kids crying for their moms, and the rest of the school shouting in excitement. Initially, observational glasses were so expensive to get before Pepsi started a marketing ad. For every three Pepsi bottles you buy, you get these glasses for free. You know, Pepsi is cheap, so we could afford it all. It is clear that the 2017 Great American Solar Eclipse was a major success for many states. Looking forward, we can use that data retrieved from 2017 to better predict and manage the upcoming 2024 solar eclipse. Museums, schools, science centers, and other organizations in the path of eclipses often see an increase in revenue 
due to the large groups of people traveling to increase their viewing probability. This, of course, has positives and negatives when it comes to community planning, as these events can be a lot to tackle logistically. We've heard how fascinating eclipses are and how attractive they are to the public, making many more likely to travel in order to have the rare opportunity to view the phenomena. But where are they going to go? How are they going to view such an event? The answer lies in community planning. It's up to organizations such as museums, science centers, and even schools to engage the community and provide an opportunity for large groups of people to view the eclipse. But how do they do this? How does it work? Kate Russo and Community Eclipse Planning outlined some basic guidelines for those looking to get involved in eclipse-related activities. With community planning, one of the most important aspects is planning ahead of time. Since eclipses are predictable, as we know, organizations can get a head start years ahead of time. With such a large event with a high probability for an equally large turnout, it's important to allocate for the most time possible. Obviously, organizations have to secure funding for eclipse endeavors. Funding would help with promotion, any materials needed, like signage, venues, and other materials such as glasses, or anything else they would like to pass out. Perhaps most important, in our opinion, is media engagement when it comes to promoting and spreading the word about the eclipse. This comes in the form of social media posts, news promotion, website creation, and other forms of media engagement. We all know how prevalent social media is now, and it proves itself to be an extremely important tool when marketing events such as these. Russo acknowledges this, prioritizing the use of accessible language, that is, not presenting events as strictly scientific. Sometimes events centered around science, or academia for that matter, can be daunting. People may be skeptical of an event and unable to relate to it if the language involved is too academic. Of course, there's still plenty of learning opportunities available, just in a much more accessible way. We had the opportunity to get in contact with Logan Rex, curator and communications director at the Armstrong Air and Space Museum in Wapakoneta, Ohio. He spoke to us about the museum's plan for the upcoming eclipse, mentioning extended museum hours, events, and activities, and guided tours on the day of the eclipse and the days leading up to it. However, he also expressed concerns with parking due to an influx in traffic, a common issue many organizations are faced with in the planning stages. Similar struggles were expressed by Amanda Rasnick, who is the Destination Development Director for Ohio's Shores and Islands who told us about the logistics of planning even something like the accessibility of restrooms due to the large number of guests, and how organizations like the Ohio Emergency Management Agency is closely involved with planning to ensure the utmost safety of guests during their visits. As we was discussed with the 2017 eclipse, many states saw a dramatic rise in visitors which not only had an economic impact, but also required meticulous planning. Both Logan Rex and Amanda Resnick provided us with valuable information and perspectives on just how much planning goes into eclipse events. As people race to view the eclipse in its totality, there's people like Rex and Resnick who manage the systems we often don't even think about, such as accessibility to restrooms or ease of parking. Here with us is Kirsten Ellingbergen, the President and CEO of the Great Lakes Science Center, located in Cleveland, Ohio, who talks about the plans of the Great Lakes Science Center during the Total Eclipse Festival. So Total Eclipse Fest really came out of very uh, coordinated conversations across Northeast Ohio. We've been working, of course, very closely with NASA Glenn Research Center. We are the NASA Glenn Visitor Center, So we work with them all the time, and we started brainstorming back in 2017. Kirsten goes on to explain some potential concerns and problems the Green Lake Science Center may face on the day of the eclipse. We started working more and more with Destination Cleveland, our local tourism bureau. And the more we coordinated across the community with other education nonprofits, um, when we coordinated with safety, traffic, you know, so many different groups that we're working with, what became clear is we needed a focal point uh, for downtown Cleveland. And uh, it's an especially exciting weekend because leading into April 8th, when we have the total eclipse, downtown Cleveland, we're going to also be hosting the NCAA Women's Final Four right here, just 
truly just right up the block. So it, that meant that we're looking for how to keep that crowd engaged. And the more we coordinated across this, the more we said, you know, we need something that will pull everyone together. And out of that came the plan for our total eclipse fest. Cities in Ohio, such as Cleveland, will be directly in the path of totality, are continuing to plan and advertise for events revolving around the eclipse. Melinda Huntley, director of the Ohio Travel Association, estimates 139 to 500,000 people will be visiting Ohio to have a chance at viewing the eclipse. With that many people visiting, Ohioans are eager to get in on the action. Here in Bowling Green, Ohio, the university has exciting events planned for this April. We got to chat again with Dr. Kate Dillenbush, who plays an important role in the planning of eclipse activities. To her, we asked, what are the BGSU's plans for this April? Yeah, so here at BGSU, we're going to have a big watch event. Uh, we're still working on the details of exactly what all that's going to entail. But uh, probably at the stadium, there will be a gathering for the eclipse. And certainly people part of the BGSU and wider Bowling Green community are welcome as well as folks who happen to be coming down 75 and maybe they can't get any farther south that day. Uh, we expect people might stop off here since it's an easy exit. And uh, we hope to have a positive experience even if the weather isn't ideal. Still having lots of other events going on, um, music playing, different exhibits, activities people can participate in kind of before and after the eclipse. So hopefully people come early and stick around and wait out a little bit of the traffic after the eclipse. She also thought, We're in a really special place to view the eclipse. And uh, one of my big goals in planning for the eclipse is to have an interdisciplinary component to the experience for everyone who comes to BGSU or from the Northwest Ohio community. Um, because eclipses are really events in, in throughout human history that have been experienced in a lot of different ways, right? Positives and negatives and have been an important part of human society, I think, uh, and the mystery of what an eclipse was for a long time. And so I think if we think a little bit about it, we can come up with connections pretty much to any discipline uh, to the eclipses, whether it be psychology, biology, astronomy, of course, but certainly history, um, ecology, many, many fields, music, art as well, how eclipses have inspired those kinds of uh, creations. You had it here. If you are in the area for the eclipse or the state of Ohio, for that matter, be sure to check out places like Bowling Green, Cleveland, and Wapo, Canada for exciting activities involving the eclipse. Of course, if you are looking for activities and events in the state of Ohio this April, be sure to check out Ohio.gov as they provided an interactive map for events all across the Buckeye State and resources for eclipse viewing. Eclipses have been a phenomenon that has intrigued the public for centuries. With such a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, many jump to the chance to view an eclipse in totality, often traveling out of state for extended periods of time. This, as we know, can largely benefit cities and towns, bringing in a significant revenue from lodging, food, and entertainment. Without the work of community planners, large viewing events would not be possible, as they require meticulous planning years ahead of time. Still, problems can arise, such as bad weather, which blocks the eclipse, and traffic jams caused by an influx in visitors. Nevertheless, eclipses offer an opportunity for valuable community building as people excitedly gather to watch and awe. If you're planning to travel to view the 2024 solar eclipse, remember to arrive early, take time to explore what the community has to offer, and most importantly, protect your eyes. Thank you for listening to Eclipsing History. This episode was designed and recorded by Nico Hartzell, Ernesto Kine, and Paige Pastor, students of the Public History Program at Bowling Green State University, under the direction of Drs. Cheryl Dong and Amilcar Chalou. Mid Story mixed and edited the episode. We thank our interviewees, Kate Dollenbush, Kirsten Ellenbogen, Andrew Hershberger, Kevin Moore, Amanda Rasnick, Logan Rex, and Kate Russo. Van Den Sina composed the original music for the podcast. Ohio Humanities provided financial support. To access other episodes and additional content, go to bgsu.edu slash eclipsing history.